Good afternoon. I'm Andrew Topp with Investing News Network, and I'm here at the PDAC show with Dr. Karen Hanghoy. Uh, she's the department head with the Department of Petrology and Economic Geology at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. Welcome. Thank you. So for people uh, unfamiliar with the region, uh, Greenland seems uh, quite exotic and remote. Can you give us a sense of Greenland's population and its infrastructure for mining? Yes, Greenland is, uh, is uh, mainly Arctic and it is remote, uh, although I'm not sure it's much more remote than Arctic Canada mm. uh, in lots of ways. The population, however, is very small. There are only about 57,000 people in Greenland uh, in an area that's, that's actually very, very large. It's larger than Finland, uh, just to name an example, and from the Nordic countries. Um, in terms of infrastructure, there are uh, a couple of international airports. Uh, there are almost no roads, only internally in the, in the towns. There's something like 80 settlements uh, where these uh, 57,000 people live and they're not connected by roads, they're connected by uh, boats and, uh, and aircraft. Um, so it's a it's slightly complicated area to operate and f from a logistics point of view, uh, for mining, one of the uh, one of the challenges are also the uh, the shipping. So there's a, if you go far enough north, there's going to be several months every year where you actually cannot uh, sail because of ice, sea ice. Right. And is the government generally supportive of mining in Greenland? Yes, they are. There's been a uh, there's been a long history of uh, of uh, some exploration. I think it's probably underexplored historically, but there has been mines like the cryolite mine. It's been active for more than 100 years. And in the last couple of decades, there's been a pretty uh, targeted effort to try to attract uh, investors and attract junior companies to uh, to explore and bring it up to the exploration level of uh, places like Canada and, uh, and Australia, for instance. So there are a lot of places, uh, are there are a lot of things in place, a lot of legislation in place uh, to to support this and to attract investors and I think in general the Greenland government are hoping that they can become even more uh, autonomous uh, by creating a sustainable economy based on, uh, on mineral resources and possibly also energy resources. Right, great, okay. Uh, Greenland is host to a number of metals including iron ore, nickel and rare earths. Um, can you give our readers a bit of a sense of the geological potential? Yes, I think that the, the geological potential in Greenland is uh, for ore deposits in general is very large because like Canada and like uh, uh, Australia, for instance, we have a, uh, an extremely long geological history with almost every uh, geological environment present from any kind of textbook. So no matter what you're looking for and what kind of geological environment you're looking for, you're pretty much going to find it. So, and again, like I said before, it, I think that Greenland has, has been explored, but not to the levels of, of Canada and Australia, for instance. So we think that there is a great potential for, for finding good deposits there, and as it is right now, there more than um, there are more than 100 licenses uh, active, and there's a handful, at least maybe uh, maybe five or ten, projects that are actually pretty advanced, and they're very also um, uh, varied. As you said yourself, there's the rare earth deposits, there are uh, there are iron deposits, there are gold deposits, there are lots of different uh, types of deposits. Yeah, and you mentioned shipping. Um, the melting of the polar ice cap could be good for mineral exploration in Greenland. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, uh, this is one of the things you hear a lot, that, that the melting of the ice is creating new ground. Mm. Uh, and that, of course, is true to some extent. The ice cap is very thick. It's three kilometers thick uh, wow. mm -hmm. in its maximum. So it is melting along the edges very slowly and pulling back, uh, sometimes exposing outcrop, but also sometimes exposing moraine. Uh, I think that because there's so much land to be covered in Greenland, and it actually isn't covered uh, well enough um, at the present time, it's not so much the retraction of the ice that's important because there's, there's enough unexplored territory without that. But what is extremely important is, as, as we briefly talked about before, this, the sail routes. Uh, it's it's uh, one of the things that enter into the, to the infrastructure calculations for any kind of deposit is, you know, how easy is it for you to get the, the, the the ore out of Greenland, and I think the uh, the global warming uh, is is uh, is going to be useful for Greenland in that respect. That you're going to get sail routes open. You're also going to get the northeast and the northwest passage possibly uh, open uh, over the next few decades. So uh, so that's something that is is. Uh, 
possibly of quite uh, great significance for Greenland. Absolutely, yeah. So Greenland's Premier recently said that Greenland will not favor European interests over China, for example, when developing its surprise rare earth deposits. So do you see increased Asian investment coming to Greenland? We certainly see increased uh, Asian interest in general. Uh, at the Geological Survey, we're not too concerned about investments. Right. Uh, so I don't really know the actual figures, uh, but many of the companies, of course, are public companies, and uh, and uh, investor lists can be retrieved uh, at the websites and various other places. Uh, but Greenland in general, I can say, have a uh, you know an open market economy, like uh, like Canada, like most of the Western world. And so there's no, uh, there's no general sort of um, preference over certain certain color of money rather than other color of money anyone who wants to come and invest and and uh, and uh, strengthen the industry in greenland is, is is welcome as it is now there are no there are no asian companies actually um, uh, active in greenland but there has been dialogues i know with uh, investment companies from from the east with for some of the companies that are trying to uh, to put together the the bankable feasibility studies and and those things we should probably make uh, a distinction too uh, what's the relationship between Greenland and Denmark? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So, uh, way back, Greenland was basically a Danish colony. And mm. from 79, there was what we call a home rule government, where there was sort of an extended um, uh, a parliament was created in Greenland and a government that took care of domestic issues. Uh, in in um, 2010, the self-rule government uh, came into effect, and this is an, a further increase in the autonomy. And so basically now Greenland has the right to govern itself in all areas except um, foreign policy and, and uh, defense. And the first thing, uh, one of the first things that the, the Greenland government, it's called uh, Nalaka Suisut, one of the first things they decided to uh, to uh, take home for, the, for their own governing was the resource area. So basically Greenland has, it, has rights sole rights to its uh, resources and is responsible for the administration of the resources. So if one wants to apply for a, a license in Greenland and all of the regulations surrounding licenses and applications, that's handled by the Greenland government directly from uh, the capital of Greenland, which is Nuuk. Um, the survey however, is the survey for both Denmark and Greenland. And we have an agreement with the Greenland government that we are still acting as the survey for Greenland because we have uh, you know, more than 100 years of history basically uh, collecting geological data. So there's still a wide uh, collaboration and there's still a political um, so, for instance, there are members of the Danish uh, parliament from Greenland and also from the Faroe Islands. But in most uh, matters concerning mining, uh, Greenland has uh, autonomy. Great. Okay. Um, Greenland was in the news lately when it was revealed that the nation is the site of the world's oldest and largest meteor impact. Uh, the, the deposit is, is rich in nickel and copper ore, so could Greenland become the next nickel hotspot? Investors might be interested to know. Yeah, the, I mean the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. We think so. Uh, not just the impact structure. Uh, I come from, uh, uh, just before this interview, as you know, we had a little Greenland day with, with uh, different uh, presentations by some of the companies active in Greenland. Mm -hmm. And the uh, company that has the, the prospect of the impact crater is called uh, North American Nickel. Yes. Uh, actually gave a presentation on their project down there. And so that's sort of a, uh, although impact makes it sound like a Sudbury, it's actually, according to the company, it's more like a Boise Bay type uh, deposit. But it's looking uh, promising. And they're planning to drill uh, next year. But uh, outside of that impact structure, there's lots of other places where there's potential for nickel mineralization. There is uh, extensive flood basalt volcanism in both West Greenland and East Greenland that's also currently under license. Um, for nickel and several places there are actually uh, chromatiite uh, sections in some of the supercrustal rocks. So there are lots of different places where nickel mineralization is being looked at, uh, intrusives, uh, donites, things like that. Great, okay. And uh, Greenland Minerals and Energy has one of the world's largest rare earth and uranium deposits, so what's the potential there? Well, I think the potential is is great. Um, the Greenland uh, government and also the, the Danish actually have a what we call a zero tolerance policy towards uranium, which means that it is currently um, not allowed to mine 
uranium, okay. even if uranium is a byproduct. So the, the, the Greenland Minerals and Energy Deposit, which is called Kvanefjell, is a, a, ura is a uranium rare earth deposit where both the rare earths and the uranium are hosted in the mineral strength stropine. And so they will not be able to mine that without also mining uranium. So they have a, uh, they've done a lot of drilling, they've done an uh, environmental um, impact assessment study and societal impact assessment study. They're working on their uh, feasibility study but they are also waiting for uh, some kind of decision on the uranium because it is up for debate right now. There is an election in Greenland in a week's time, next Tuesday on the, um, I believe it's the 12th, and uh, and uh, it's, it's been one of the issues in the, um, in the election has been whether they should lift the ban on uranium to allow for this deposit and potentially other deposits in Greenland to be mined. Um, so it's been debated for about the last couple of years and there's a, a lot of people who are who are uh, collecting knowledge, you could say, and data. And there's been visits to, for instance, Canada, to look at how uranium mining is being uh, handled in Canada. So, uh, so there's a big potential at the uh, GME um, uh, site, but they are waiting for the political uh, decision of whether it's going to be possible to mine it. Yep. Right. Okay. Uh, are there other companies that you could name that our investor audience might be interested in in looking up? There are lots of different companies. Uh, uh, one of the things that I can recommend is that the, uh, at the website of the Bureau of Minerals and Petroleum in the NUC, there is a, uh, an updated list of all licenses. It gets updated uh, twice a month. And in that list, you can also see who actually has the license. Um, and then people can go and look at their websites. But for instance, we mentioned GME. We mentioned North Am uh, American Nickel. Uh, a company that's very active in uh, several different locations is uh, Avenar Resources, which is an English registered, it's a private company registered in England but operating in, in Copenhagen. They're based in Denmark. Um, they have several prospects. They have zinc prospects. Uh, they have a nickel prospect. They have copper prospect in East Greenland. Um, there's a company called 21st North, also a Danish company, working on several prospects. There's a Greenlandic company. It's a public company. It's called Nuna Minerals, based in Nuuk. Several prospects, uh, both in North and South Greenland. They're looking for gold especially, but also other commodities. Australian companies, there's several. Uh, there's a, a company called Tambries, private company, uh, has a rare earth deposit right next to, to uh, GMEs. Mm -hmm. Prospect. This particular deposit does not contain uranium, so they have uh, they don't have that challenge uh, on that deposit. Another Australian company is uh, Ironbark, who has a very very large zinc deposit in North Greenland, which is uh, has been developed uh, over the last 20 years. It was originally discovered by Platinova uh, back in the 1990s. Uh, so also a very big uh, project. Another Australian company is uh, Platina. They have a big gold and palladium prospect on the east coast. Uh, but those are just to mention a few. There are more than 30 companies. And again, uh, with the danger of having left out someone important, I recommend that anyone who's interested in investing in, the, in Greenland to look at the BMP website where you can get a complete list of all uh, license holders. Okay, and do you have the address for that? I do. That is uh, www.bmp for bureaus of mineral and petroleum dot gl. And uh, you can also go to the uh, to our website, the Geological Survey of Greenland, which is www.geus.dk. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us about um, Greenland's uh, geological potential and then some of its uh, strategic importance as well. It's a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I've been speaking with uh, Dr. Karen Hanghoy of the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. I'm Andrew Topp for Investing News Network. Thanks for joining me.